In this video, we're going to pick up from where we left off. We're going to load in our console asset and then texture it inside of Substance Painter. Go to File, New. At the top is your template type. For right now, all you need to think about is that this is your shader, and this is how it's going to light the object. Right here, we're using physically based rendering, metallic roughness. It's a good flow to work with for now. If you happen to be working with alpha blended or alpha tested objects, you might want to choose one of them. However, you can always select and modify the template inside of Substance later on. Now, go to File, hit Select, navigate to the location of your FBX, select it. For normal map format, we're going to choose OpenGL. And then if you'd like to, you can use Auto Unwrap if you did not unwrap your asset before. However, you'll notice it says Experimental, and the results are very mixed at the moment. So I recommend you unwrap things in Blender or whatever program you're using first, as you can create far better unwraps only use this if you're trying something out or changing things or you really don't care about the outcome too much. Now before you hit OK, the document resolution is important. And this is the thing that's going to be kind of limited based upon the hardware you're working with. This value only matters in terms of the preview. When you go to export things or even while you're working, you can adaptively change this whenever you want to. Go ahead and hit OK. Now at this point you want to do some sanity checks. Rotate around your object by holding down Alt and left mouse clicking to see it from all views. Things look okay. Now there are a couple seams here and there that we might be able to tweak inside a blender or maybe change our normals or our UV layouts, but for the most part, the asset's fine. The next thing we want to do is take a look at our texture set list. My layout might be a little bit different from yours, but pretty much everything's going to be on this panel over here or on the screen. What's important is what it's called. Texture set list is all the materials you have access to on this object. For this object, we only use one material, Console M. The texture set settings are where we can modify the particular texture set we're working with. The most important one is size right here. If you happen to choose a size too large and you notice your computer is losing performance, consider changing this down to 1024 or 512. The entire idea behind Substance Painter is that it is procedural and it can update. Therefore, you can scale the textures up and down without worrying. And in fact, you can work at 512 if you want to, if your computer can only support that. But then when you go to export, you can crank that up to 4096. With the computer I'm running on, 2048 works just fine. The next part is channels. Here in the channel section, you'll notice we have things like base color, height, roughness, metallic, and normal. Those channels were set up when we chose our template when we started. If we want to add additional channels, we can press the plus button up here. And in fact, there are two channels I want to add. Ambient Occlusion, which darkens elements near corners, and then we're also going to go ahead and add Emissive. This allows us to have lighting effects on our object that are controlled by texture. As you scroll down, Mesh Maps is another important area. It says Select Normal Map, ID Map, and so forth. And if you had pre-generated these elsewhere, you could. However, usually you're going to bake your Mesh Maps. Click this button and this window will pop up. And this will go through a series of algorithms that will calculate different kinds of textures for the surface that describe its characteristics. At the beginning, keep the resolution at 512 or lower while you're testing to make sure things work. Go ahead and just click Bake Selected Textures for right now. Hit OK, and what you're gonna to wanna to do is hit the B key on your keyboard or click up here and look through these mesh maps at the bottom. These are the output of what you just did. What you want to do is try to look for errors or glitches or things where it doesn't look quite right. This will save you some time, lets you go back into Blender and adjust things as necessary. So hit the B key and just cycle through. You might notice on some of these, like ambient occlusion and a few others, you're going to get some artifacts here and there, and that's just due to the fact that we did a very fast bake. If we come back to bake mesh settings and we think everything's fine, I'm going to actually raise this to 1024. I usually like to keep the output size somewhere near, like a one off from whatever the actual resolution I'm working at is. Down here is high definition meshes. If you had a high quality version of this mesh that you wanted to project details onto the surface as a normal texture, you could do so. You would select it here, select whatever the mesh would be, and it would use that when it renders. The most important thing for you to do is, if your settings are proper, go ahead and increase your sub sampling. I'm gonna do it eight by eight. This is a one-time thing, it's a one-time bake, so it's perfect, even if it's slow, to click the button, have it high, walk away, come back a minute later, and see the results. I'm gonna go ahead and click Bake Selected Textures. You'll notice that this is taking a little bit longer. Hit OK, and you'll see that a lot of those aliasing issues, those jaggies as we call it, are much softer, if even present at all. 
Now you'll notice that our mesh maps are filled with all of these over here. What's important to understand is that mesh maps, these baked ones, are in a separate category from the layers we'll be actually drawing on, and sometimes that can get you into trouble. Just keep that in mind. Now there's nothing stopping you from closing out one of these and actually bringing this texture into a layer if you wanted to. I'm going to keep them over here for now, unless I have a reason. Now I am going to change my layout a little bit. The Texture Set Settings window really is only needed maybe once or twice. After that, I'm going to close it and it actually gets docked over here. Since I'm only working with one Texture Set list on this object, I can close this as well. I'm going to move my layers to the other side because changing layers is less frequent than the painting tasks I'm going to be doing over here. Moving this up to the side, you'll notice immediately that my shelf here is going to be filled with a lot more stuff than yours. And that's just because I have a lot of working projects and I have a lot of materials I've either created or downloaded through Substance Source. If you would like to add additional materials, you can go ahead and open up Substance and go to Substance Source. And you'll notice there's a series of free 50 assets. Go through here, find any you like, and then you can click the load in Substance or send to Substance painter button, or you can download it and manually place it yourself if you want to. Either one's fine, but there are quite a few here that are very interesting, like Rust Brown, that's a great one to have. Some of these wooden effects are good, as well as the cloth. Once you've gotten anything you want to, let's take a minute to take a look at our layout. Obviously we have a view here, F1 will split this into a 2D and a 3D view, F2 is just 3D, F3 is UV, if we go back to F2, F6 is going to give us an orthographic view, F5 gives us a perspective view. If we hit M on the keyboard, this shows us the material as if all of the different effects that the shader is doing are visible in this viewport. If we hit B, we go through the baked maps. If we hit C, we go through the different maps that we have activated in our texture set. Here, base color, height, roughness, metallic, normal, ambient occlusion, and emissive. Our layers panel over here starts with a paintable layer. That means I can come over here, I have my brush selected over here, and I can actually, if I wanted to, paint on the surface. Now, I'm clicking and holding, but you can't see anything. And the reason for that is because this is set to ambient occlusion. I can click here and choose material, or I could have hit M. Now you can see that I'm painting on the surface right here. Not really effective though. Painting's great, but it can be destructive. And if you're not the greatest artist, or if you're using a mouse, sometimes trying to paint things isn't terribly easy. So let's nuke that layer by hitting the trash bin over there. Now this is a futuristic kind of control panel, so let's try to find some materials that'll work. In a shelf, you can see that I can type in different things, and this filter will find anything that falls under that category. So here is an iron raw damaged. I'm gonna click and drag this over to layers. And what this does is create a fill layer. It means that the procedural material is going to be filling this entire object however it sees fit. The only way to restrict it is by right clicking or clicking this button here and creating a mask. If I right click and create a white mask, not much changes because white means 100% opacity, opaque, you'll see it. If I right click and hit black mask, it disappears because black is invisible. Any value between white and black is however much you're gonna be blending it with the layer below it. For right now, let's keep it as black. Now once again, we could try to paint, but I already said that that's not necessarily terribly effective. Faster way, if you know what it is you want to select, is to use this tool over here called Polygon Fill. This has four different modes, and based upon how you created your object, and if you're thinking ahead, these can be either very easy to work with or very difficult. The first one is just per triangle. I can come over here and select individual triangles. The next one is per polygon. Now, in order for us to get some of the data we needed, I had gone ahead and triangulated the surface, so this mode isn't really going to do much for me at all. The next mode is mesh fill. This is based upon the mesh connectivity. So here, this entire object is connected, therefore when I click it, the whole thing gets filled. However, some of these other parts, like this handle, is separate from this piece here, and these other pieces as well. If I'd like to undo that, I can of course, I can go to my Properties tab and move this from white to black, and then select or select everything as you see there. Now if you're smart when you set up your UVs, if we press F1, you can actually select by how these are separated. For instance, let's go back to white. I'll click here, and you'll notice this element becomes selected, which is this piece here. Of course, I can start selecting these over here as well, and you can see the different parts being selected. We can go through and begin selecting all the different elements that work for us. There we are, and there we are. 
And let's do the underside of this object as well and the backside. Wonderful. And that's probably a good start. Let's also do the sides of these arms here and here as well. And maybe this bottom part there. I'm also going to check out my AO and my emission ones as well, so I have something to work with. However, at this time, they're going to be purely black because it's not adding anything to those. In fact, it's good practice usually, rather than turning these on a layer, which is masked off, to create some base layers below everything. So for instance here, we can just call this emissive base and turn off everything but emissive. And actually, let's call this AO and emissive. This is going to be our base channel so we have some data. Here we have ambient occlusion. That's about a value of one. We have emission, which is going to be black. Now, if we check these, we'll see that we have that there. And we also have a black value there. Now let's apply some additional materials to this object to make it look interesting. Let's pick a plastic value this time, and let's just choose this plastic mat, bring this up to the top. Interestingly, it covers everything, so we're going to need to use a mask to reduce what it impacts. However, what we need to be careful about is certain layers will additively put their detail onto subsequent layers. It just doesn't replace things. Base color under normal is going to replace what's below it and above it. However, other channels, such as the height map or the normal map, will not replace. Instead, you'll notice that the blend mode up here in the top of the layer is set to something called normal map detail or something else for that matter. So if we come over here to say normal, you'll see that we have normal data coming in over here. Now, if I turn off plastic, right? Now, plastic isn't adding any normal data in this case, so we're okay. But we will notice that we're getting normal data from iron raw. Had we not masked out these elements, and actually if I hold down shift and press this, we can see the result. You'll notice that if we cancel that mask out, we can see the detail here. If we turn on the plastic mat, nothing's being overridden. But that's also because we have no normal channel. If I turn on the normal channel so that there is data, and here you can see it's just a pure color, it's not overriding that information. If we changed how it blends, like switching it to normal, we'll see now that this information is now being overridden by the layer above it. So just be careful when you blend things because you, they could have unintended consequences. I'm going to hit shift and click this layer to bring it back. Come back up here, hit M on the keyboard to bring back my materials. I'm going to see this plastic mat peer here. I'm going to right click and we're going to add a black mask. I'm going to come back over here. I'm going to select by UVs. I'm going to select this one down here and this one on the side and this one over here. Now that plastic doesn't look terribly good, so why don't we choose some other color? Maybe a darker, dimmer color down here. When you're working with PBR, you usually don't want to use values way up here or down here. You want to pick a little bit up there so that the lighting algorithms have some values to work with. We can see what we got there, and that's all right. It's just a sort of flat plastic. And if we want to, we can change the roughness to make it a little bit smoother. And I would really like some texture on this surface though. So I'm going to just take a quick look and see if I have anything that will liven this up a bit. Let's type in plastic again. And we've got this interesting aluminum insulation one. So let's click and drag this. Now that's kind of cool, but it's also very intense. And actually I don't really want the color necessarily, I just kind of want the pattern. So what we can do is turn off the color contribution right here, and you'll notice that the color disappears. However, the pattern is still influencing other channels height, roughness, and metal. And if you start turning off these other channels, you'll see what is being influenced and what isn't. Here, we only have the height information coming through. If we want to, we can also turn on normal. You can see a lot more data right there coming through. So it's up to you how you want to use it. But I, I kind of like this, although the normal is a little intense. So maybe if we choose one or the other, or what we can do is, for normal, come down to the technical parameters and dial down that intensity a bit, just so it's a little bit there. Now what I can do is I can come up to this object, I can go over to scale and maybe scale it up twice, get that pattern to go over a few more times. I'm noticing that things aren't looking quite right, and many times you can adjust your UV projection to make it look better. In this case, it's triplanar, so it's coming from the top, uh, from it's coming from the top, front, and right side. But I'm noticing inconsistencies between the left and the right side. Well. Why don't we just right click this layer? Let's get this layer the way we want it first. This is still a little extreme. And actually, I want to get this top bit right. So I'm going to rotate this until this is pretty much perpendicular to that surface. And that's kind of nice. 
I am going to dial back that normal intensity just a little bit. I'm going to dial back the height range a little bit too. Now I'm going to right click on this object. I'm going to add a black mask. I'm going to come over here and select UV. I'm going to select this back piece. Now we've got this kind of nice pattern overlaid on top of here. But I want that on this side too. However, I'm going to want it a different orientation. So let's rename this aluminum insulator front. Let's go ahead and duplicate this one and let's call this sides instead. Now I can black that out again and I can add it to the sides. And now I have a different channel or different layer, excuse me, controlling the sides. We can come back over here, adjust the rotation. So if I don't like how it is, I can move that anywhere I want to. I can adjust the scale as well. And you know what, let's, let's do something like this, maybe there. And then if we hit W, we can go back to this mode here. And then we can start playing. So I can do something like that. And then once again, if we hit scale by using W, E, and R, remember that these are going to be different from Blender's hotkeys. We can move this until we get something we kind of like. And that's not so bad. I think I can live with that. If you want more control, you can go to the 3D projection settings here and modify them. And now we can just try to recenter things as best as we like. Great. So now we've got our box with an interesting texture on the side. Now one thing I really like is actually adding little bolts. And one of the areas that does this are going to be our tools. For this I'm going to actually use a paint layer and I'm just going to call this bolts. And we'll come over here and I'll just look over here somewhere and I'm going to use hotkeys. We could control the brush size here if we wanted to, but this is kind of a pain. Instead, with Substance, if you hold down Control and right click and move left and right, it's the size. And then if we do the left mouse button, we can rotate this or we can go left and right and that also impacts the flow. All right, so now that we have something I like, we'll pick a size and we can just start popping them down, but we need this to work properly for us. So here you can see our alpha. I'm going to make sure I double click on screw and if I select and click, now we've got something that we want. So there's a screw, and there's a screw. We'll put a screw in each corner. Now you'll notice the orientations are randomizing. And of course you can come into inside of here and do things like increase that angle jitter. You can change the size if you wanted to, although it doesn't make a lot of sense for bolts. So let's just add maybe a couple other bolts. Maybe smaller bolts for this little panel over here, right? Now one interesting thing is if you wanted to make a line of these, what you can do is click and hold down shift and drag somewhere else. And if you hold down control, it's going to be a straight line, but that's best in orthographic mode. But here I can click again and it's going to add bolts all the way through. Now that's obviously too many. And what we can do is adjust our spacing and increase that size. So now if we come here and let's go with an orthographic view by hitting F6 somewhere like this. And if I click here and go all the way over to here, click there, you can see we get these regular spacing of bolts. Once again, not a happy fan of that. So let's try that again. Click there, maybe go to there. And that's a little bit better, something like that. And then you can play around with that to make it do pretty much whatever you want to. And decrease that spacing down. I'm probably just going to be working on this manually here. So we can add maybe another bolt down here and just give it some life. Let's just add a few more bolts randomly on this object in different locations that kind of make sense. Most likely you will not be seeing under this control panel, but adding a little bit of detail there can add a lot of interesting information later on. Little things that no one will expect. We can also, if we want to, try to add scratches to the surface where it might be used a lot. And I'm going to make another paint layer for this called the scratches. And then we can just kind of add some here and there. Now you're not going to see much right now because the surface doesn't have anything on it, but we will later. And then probably when you're moving this layer up and down, you would have ended up with some scratches somewhere over there. And then probably quite a few on this surface right here, probably right there and right in front of here as well. And if that's a little bit too much, we can always go back and erase it using the erase tool. Maybe those scratches shouldn't exist, those ones there. And then if you really want to, you could come back to something like the base color and just dial that back. And then if you hit C for channel, we can see what layers are really getting affected by those scratches. And here you can see roughness is a big one. So if we come here and look at the roughness, we can back that off a bit too, hit M, and we'll notice that this effect is much more subtle than it was before. Now let's add some textures to the rest of this object. So I'm going to go back to material 
and let's find something that works on this handle. And let's check out source. I'm gonna to try to limit myself to the free assets so that you're working with similar things. Here we've got some fabrics. This jersey stitch might have something interesting. So I'm gonna go ahead and transmit that. We also have this cross copper brushed, which is interesting to me as well. And if we continue to look down, we also have this rust brown. Let's grab that. Oh, and this leather too. You never know when you might need them. So go ahead and grab them. So here's the bull leather. And let's go ahead and put this somewhere in here as well. Just drag and drop that. And I'm gonna make sure I'm just working in base color for now. And we can see it's applied to everything a bit much. Right click, black mask. We're going to come over here. I'm gonna use my UV layout to add these. Now that's kind of ugly. So let's in decrease the scale or actually increase the scale to decrease the detail. So let's go there. Two is not so bad, maybe 2.5, somewhere around that. Color, I'm gonna darken just a little bit, make it aged. The roughness, I wanna crank up just a little bit as well. Okay, so we got a nice leather handle there. Now we need something for this little area down in here. So why don't we come to our materials and let's just find a plastic. And we can see we have a plastic mat. So let's grab plastic mat, bring it up here and right click black mask. Once again, use our UVs to apply that to both of those surfaces and that's okay. But once again, the color is not my favorite. So let's find something, maybe a dull red value. And maybe we should add some sort of interesting texture to the surface. Once again, why don't we add another paint layer to this? And we can come down to our brushes if we want to and try to brush something. Or we can come to our alphas right here and we can see some interesting different patterns. Now let's take a look at this in the split screen mode. Now it looks like this part here is this there and this there as well. The benefit of having this completely flat is if I was to paint on this surface, it's much easier for me to paint in a straight line than it is this curved shape. However, we can get creative. And if we come at this from a sort of an orthographic view, we can try to paint something onto the surface here. So once again, let's just find something, maybe this arrow strip, and we can rotate this vertically. And if we want to, we can just try to apply it. Let's go ahead and get rid of that and let's make this a fill layer instead and go back to materials and let's go to metals and this aluminum one is kind of funky and weird. So let's try that again. But this time we're going to, let's see, we have a pattern. We have the grid intensity, which I'm gonna lower. And we have the fold intensity, which I'm gonna get rid of. And then there's this tile value. So we can tile this very high. And I'm gonna actually do triplanar projector right there. And we're gonna see if any of this works. We're gonna right click on black, come at this from here, and let's create a paint layer. Now with my alphas, we'll go back to those double, triple arrows. And what we can do now is just paint here. So you can see that if we select this arrow here, make it bigger, maybe rotate it something like this. And if we need it precise, we can come up here and choose a better angle. So here's, we'll do 270 exactly. And then we can just plop, plop, and maybe plop there. Now, part of the issue with doing it this way is I'm hitting that little bit there, but we can paint that off if we need to. But the benefit of not doing this on a painted layer is, well, you'll see shortly what I mean. I guess up is the right position, but I don't like now the material. So since we did this on a mask, I can come in here and just try to find something that works. Just go back to some of those plastics we were working with before. In this case, we can choose a high gloss one if we'd like to and replace that by dragging and dropping it into the material. And you can see it right there. I kind of want these to feel like they're off the surface. So I'm gonna click height. And then on the height portion of this, I'm gonna actually recess this down by moving the height lower than the height of this other texture on top of it. And then we get this nice little imprinting effect. Once again, let's change this as well. And maybe, I don't know, we could choose any of these colors really. I guess for right now, we'll choose something. Actually, let's go with maybe a yellow. That's a little bit much, maybe. Pick something in there, perhaps. Now let's add some more effects here. So we need something on this band and we need something on this button. And once again, we can probably just get away with this plastic one and just make this black. Select this object, select this right here, select this part here, or select the entire element, 
and I'll select this element here as well. That would be the same thing. Changing the color again, let's go ahead and just make them some sort of a greenish color. And then we might need to put some kind of a symbol or something. Let's, let's make this a little dark. Let's make a, another layer and let's just call this blood print. And I'm going to once again choose plastic on this layer, but this time we're going to make this a reddish kind of color here. And let's, the roughness is going to be very low. I'm going to make sure that this has height information. I'm going to right click, go to black mask. And what I want to do is zoom in on this, hit F2, so we just look at this. And what I'm after is we're going to use a brush and I'm going to go to alpha and I'm going to type in hand and you can see there's some really great hand prints and some bloody smears so the idea is some operator was here before and we can make some really kind of nasty stuff and what we can do is duplicate by hitting control D that layer bring this one under it right click and I'm going to add what's called a filter if I click filter here I can get any of these different procedural filters that will modify that layer in particular, I'm going to do a blur direction. I'm going to kind of play with this, so maybe that way. What I want is for this to kind of streak out, something like this. And then since this, I kind of want this to streak only in one direction. Let's, let's change that a little bit and increase that intensity. And then what I might also do is I'll right click on this at a levels. And below this one, I need to kind of boost seeing that a bit, I think. So just playing around here. And once again, if you hit Alt and click here, we can see the mask as we work, which really helps out. And you can see that what I'm trying to do is just push these a little bit further, make them a little bit more visible. There we go. Now, I don't want it to be smeared up at the top, so there's nothing saying I can't come back here, right click, add a paint layer on top of this. And in this case, we can just paint some blacks in. So I can click on, whoops, and click, whoops. I'm on paint again. Get rid of that alpha right there, or choose a brush from your brush shelf down here, that's got some variation to it. And then just, whoops, let's make this black. And just sort of cut out elements that you don't really like. And of course you can zoom in as much as you want to and you can get as pristine and, and right as you'd like. It's entirely up to you. Now this layer itself, in combining these two, I'm not, not really loving what's going on yet. So what I can do is we can start just dialing back the intensity. This, this is the opacity of that particular layer, and it's different for each of these. So you might want to go through and just make small modifications for each one, okay? So that they blend in well. Now I'm going to go to this top layer, and I want this to feel like it's popping out of the surface. So I have my height on. I'm going to go to height. I'm going to actually push this up so that it's on a higher plane than the surface underneath it which gives it this nice little feel here. And now if you really want to get interesting, maybe we can go to particle effects and we can find something like leaks right here. So another thing we can do is try to use the particle effects in conjunction with our mask to make this a little bit more interesting. So here we have leaks heavy and I can just sort of smash this here. We can see this kind of going off to the side. That's not quite what we're after, is it? So we can try maybe a splat and then just kind of do something off to the side. Once again, it's a little heavy handed, but if you play with it, you might be able to get something you like. Now I'm looking at this green, and not only is the green a little offensive to me at this point, so I'm gonna dial that down a bit, but the roughness, I'm just gonna crank up a little bit higher, and just a bit much, but we'll, we'll get to that later. And now I'm looking at this, and this is kind of reminding me of either McDonald's or ketchup and mustard. So I'm not enjoying some of the choices I've made. So let's go back here and maybe make a few changes. So purple and yellow is always a bad combination. So let's, let's just go with maybe a dark, a very dark value, something like this. And then for those pieces here, of course, we can come in and we can change. And that's part of the great thing about Substance Painter is you can just tweak to your heart's content. And you know what? Let's make these buttons match this button up here. So come here, change this, come over here and choose this top piece. Oops. Let's just choose this piece here and this piece there. And we've got sort of a red button going on the top. Now let's do something on this back portion. Not sure what, let's just try something. Let's open up a fill layer and let's go to materials and just see what we have. And here I have an interesting one. It's a bronze hex pattern. So let's try that really fast. That's kind of interesting. So if we were to add a black mask and then just make sure this is the only part added and come down here, we can go ahead and change our scale. Now let's, let's try changing this to 
try planar, see what we get there. That's interesting, but well, you know what? Let's leave it as UV for right now. Maybe increase that to a size of, I don't know, three, maybe four. That's interesting. And come down here, now here's our density of these. This is another way of changing things without affecting the scale. But importantly is we can start modifying some of these other parameters to get a shape that we actually like. The height orientation variation is a little high. So let's just decrease all these. There we go, so that's kind of interesting. All right, it's certainly not terribly pretty, but let's, let's add something to sort of make this a little bit more cohesive. And by that, I mean maybe adding some rust or some dirt layers on top. So here we have that rust brown we downloaded. Let's just add this to the top. Now that's very in your face. So immediately I'm gonna dial back the normal intensity and the range at which it affects things. And I'm also gonna maybe darken this a bit, maybe a little less brown, more gray. Now what we can do is we can add what's referred to as a smart mask. So smart masks mean it's going to look at the layout of the object to determine how to apply this. And you can read them, but what I recommend is you just click and drag and put it wherever you want to and see the effects. Here we get this sort of dirty edge as it's described there. I'm not really a fan of that. So why don't we try this other one here? And you'll notice now we get it all along these curved parts of our object. And how did it do that? Well, if we go into the mask editor, there's really no magic here. You can check here that the curvature is what's being used. So anywhere there's high curvature is where we're going to get that effect. And if we dial that down or crank that up, we can make it a little bit more subdued. And this is where the true skill comes out, is making sure your effects aren't too overbearing. So here we have another curvature, and then we can, it looks like this one's kind of almost inverted from what the other one was. We can pick something maybe a little bit lower, somewhere around that, perhaps. Now, some of these two have the ability to have ambient occlusion. So if we turn AO on in this case, and we come up here and go to ambient occlusion, we can see what this map is actually doing. And if we come over here to ambient occlusion, we turn this off and on, you can see it's adding a tremendous amount of detail, but it might be a bit much. So we can always use this slider here to crank that down. Hit M again, and I'm liking that a little bit better. The importance here is that it's apply this to everything, and sometimes you don't want that. So I can come over here. Why don't we add a paint layer to this object? And I'm gonna go with a paintbrush. Doesn't really matter what, but uh, we can find something that'll work. Maybe this dirt one here. So coming down here, let's go to black. And specifically on some parts like this button, I really don't want so much of this rust coming through. So we can just play and see what we like. I'm gonna just decrease that a little bit, especially up here at the top. I see the button not being used up there as much and people's hands being down here. And there's nothing saying you can't come over here, crank this to white, turn the opacity down and just start building up your surface, okay? Sometimes that's the best thing to do is to just slowly build up little bit by little bit. And you can see now that's starting to come through. Now, if you're impatient, you're gonna you can crank that up a bit and but sometimes just building it up bit by bit is a little bit nicer and then of course don't like it go back over and start reducing it and usually somewhere between those two worlds of too much and too little you'll find something that you like now i'm going to admit right now i'm not a fan of this at all this is probably one of the ugliest things i've ever created in my life but i'm trying to show technique here and i'm not trying to necessarily create the most interesting looking thing so yeah, way too much, like this slider here. I mean, it's interesting, but really, yeah, let's, let's crank that opacity up a bit and just kind of get rid of it. Having something is nice, and I kind of like this, although I think I want more like finger smudges, if anything, right there, right? So if we came back to paint and we chose an alpha that has a finger, fingerprint, like this one right here, we crank that up, right? And then let's, uh, let's make this, whoops paint and finger please and brush thank you oops and we don't want it to be all over the place like this so we're going to need to crank down some of these parameters uh, the size jitter position jitter angle jitter flow jitter and just maybe put a couple of these here and once again if it's too much just go back go down here pick something else Maybe just get rid of the alpha. And, well, that's a little bit much. Let's make our opacity lower. And just start dialing it back. 
little bit here. Now, you probably want to use a softer brush, something like this, to do that. But, and, and many times, it's about accumulating layers on layers on layers. So we can come back here and we can look for something else. Like, let me see if I have anything that's kind of dirt. So we have a mud brown. We can take this mud brown and put it on top of everything if we wanted to. So here's a mud brown. And there it is everywhere. Now, once again, we're going to kind of get rid of some of those tones. And I'm probably going to crank down the height and the normal intensity on this surface a bit. Actually, you know what? Let's make that normal. Let's make those normals more pronounced and actually turn it on. Eh, okay. Maybe not quite so much. Something like that. And we're going to crank that roughness up. And we're going to get rid of the stones in the surface, obviously. And then what we can also do is adjust the luminosity and the contrast. To really make that sort of pop a little bit more. We could use smart materials or we could right click, go create a black mask and then use some of these grunge textures instead if we wanted to, or even procedural ones. So here, let's see if we can find something that looks like smudges. Here we go, down here at the bottom, these wipe marks. Let's click right here and make these larger. I like these white marks. So let's grab one of them, put that in there, right? So let's go to right click and go to fill. And then I'm going to click and drag this into this grayscale part. And this is going to apply it throughout. If we hold down Alt and click, we can kind of see what's going on. And that's not quite what we want. So why don't we modify this? I'm going to change that scale up to maybe, I don't know. Actually, that's probably worse. Let's go to triplanar instead. And once again, now just play. And you know what? I don't like to. I think I'm going to dial this down. Maybe 1.5 and get what you like. I see a lot of use over there maybe. And then we can see what's happening here. And then don't be afraid to turn it off and turn it on. And you can see it's added all this little bit of detail here and here. And you can always paint out anything you don't like. Or if you want more, you can either affect it here by adjusting things like the balance, see? Or the contrast. And if that's not what you want, you can invert it, but that's a little bit much, but then go back in there and move the contrast and the balance to the other side. And now I get these deep pockets. We can also right click and add something like a levels. And now we can come in here and begin modifying the output a bit, right? As you can see here, get something that we actually like. Now this is a bit much for some of these different areas, especially right here. So of course, just go back Try moving things around and see if you like what's happening. If you don't like this grunge map, put a different one on. This one is much more diffuse across the entire surface. What about this one? That one's even worse. How about this one? That one's got a lot of wiping marks. And we can come back to our levels now, maybe dot back that off a bit, get this in the center point here, and then try to move this around somewhere. Easiest way to see what a levels does is to right click and add another levels on top of it. So here we can add another levels. So here's the previous level, and by recentering this to here, you'll notice that that center point now goes to the middle. If on this one, we were to put this here and this one here, it's going to rearrange this entire thing so that it moves mostly across the entire surface, as you can see there. But that's kind of overkill. But that's one way that I usually try to do sanity checks on things, is by doing a double levels. And I really don't like the normal information coming in on this. So once again, come in here, check the normals, and you can see it heavy there, very not heavy there. Hold down Alt, click here. We can see how much white there is, or levels of gray. We really don't want that. I want a lot more of the black le levels in this. So I'm going to push this up and move this over to the other side, somewhere like that. And then we can start to see what's happening. And you'll notice now there's a lot less of that stuff, right? It's just a little bit here and there to make the surface more interesting. And of course, you can take as long as you want to to make this interesting. The last thing I want to do is add an emissive channel to this. That is, I want some parts of this to be able to glow, possibly. So let's right click and let's just uh, actually create a new fill layer. Let's just call this emissive. And I'm thinking this top piece up here and maybe this button over here. I'm gonna turn off all of my channels except for emission. I want this to actually be pure white in this case. And I don't want all this, we're gonna black out most of it. And I'm going to come over here, grab UV mode and grab the top bit here and here, and then maybe this button. 
And you know what? I would kind of like these arrows to be able to pulse and glow as well, but how do I get that information? So let's identify where those arrows are first. We're just gonna hide layers, and here it is. Now if I hit Alt and Tab, you'll see that it's a mask. Well, in Substance, you can anchor things and use them later. So I can right click on this, add an anchor. You'll see it says fill layer one mask. I can come up to this emissive now. I'm gonna right click and let's add a fill layer. In this fill layer, you'll see I have an option here to press this and put something in there. And you could put a texture if you wanted to, or you can reference an anchor. I'm gonna reference that anchor right here. You also have the option of changing the levels if you want to, or inverting them, and very often that's something you'll want to do. If we go to emissive right here, is using the selection I made here and these ones over here to work. Now if I wanted to add other elements, say this one over here, you'll notice it says this effect is not paintable. How do I add? Well, just come over here, add another paint layer on top of this, and if we go over here and select this element right there, you can see that we've added that to what we're working with as well. Once again, do a quick sanity check, hit C to go through our channels, that's our mask. If I hit C, base color, height, roughness, metallic, normal, ambient, emissive. And it looks like we're okay. So now let's go to File and Export Textures. We're gonna to need to create a template for Unity for the standard shader. I have quite a few created for all the projects I work on, but you're gonna start with something like Unity Universal Render Pipeline. Go ahead and click on that. When we want the meta metallic standard, we don't, we're not working with specular in, in this series. We're going to click Copy, and I'm gonna rename this. And I'm just gonna call this Unity Standard Shader. And then you might wanna say something like AO and Emissive, because that's what we're also going to include. Now this is actually a wonderful system they've created. Over here are the different maps that you have, all right? Over here are the mesh maps that you baked. And these are converted maps that basically are sort of a function that can combine different ones or maybe do one minus or flip things here and there. But they're convenient ones that you might need to work with. Over here are your output maps. You notice that it says dollar sign mesh. That means it's going to use the name of the mesh, underscore the name of the texture set, underscore albedo. Now, because I typically name my materials after the object they're with, I already have the dollar sign mesh incorporated into this. So usually I can get rid of that and it doesn't impact me. What I will do is add a new gray channel one though. In this grayscale one, I'm gonna copy this and paste this here. And under this, I'm gonna call this AO instead for ambient occlusion. Now, if we use the ambient occlusion from input maps, we're gonna run into a problem. This is gonna be ambient occlusion from the maps in our layers. If we use ambient occlusion from mesh maps, that's gonna be the ambient occlusion that was baked. What we want to use is the mixed AO. So I'm gonna click this, drag this over here into this slot and say, gray channel information, please. Now, very frequently, ambient occlusion might be 16 bits of precision. If you change this to eight bits plus dithering, it's gonna do some magic behind the scenes so that when you take a larger precision number like 16 down to eight, it doesn't create a stair step pattern. That is, you don't get breaks, discontinuities as much throughout the surface. So I do recommend setting that up if you can. Everything else is fine. One thing that I typically do though is shorten these names just because they can get pretty long. So something like either base color or just albedo, trans, and then maybe just M and S for metallic and smoothness, and then normal just can just be norm, and then emission can just be emiss. And that just makes workflow a little bit easier when you don't have these names so long. Come back to settings. You gotta choose a folder. So let's go back to my desktop temporarily. And usually what I do is within my workspace, I'll have a folder called substance. And then in substance, I will also have another folder called, oops, and have another folder called Painter, and that's where I'm going to save my painter files. I'll also have another folder called Textures, and then in this, I will name this whatever the mesh or material name is. Uh, it depends how many layers I go based upon what I'm doing, but in this case, it's just gonna be console, and then in here is where I'm going to be exporting out. Now we need to choose the template. We just made it, click on this, and try to find it. Here's Unity Standard Shader AO Emissive. We'll select that. File type PNG, 8 bits. I'll do 8 bits plus dithering. That's just a fail safe in case something bad happens. Texture size, now this is where you get to pick. 
I'm going to pick 4096 because I can always dial these down in Unity later if I want to. But if you're hurting for space, go ahead and crank it down to 2048. But what's important to understand is what you worked at is not what you export at. You can always crank this up or lower depending upon what you're doing. Padding is what does it do with the rest of the image? Because you notice the UVs don't cover everything. So this is going to dilate, that it's going to take the pixels on the edge of the UVs and then just extend them off to infinity or as far as will be allowed on the texture you're working with. If you want to do a sanity check, click on the console M and just look at the output here. Or go to list of exports and check them out over there. I'm going to go ahead and hit export now. Looking at our ambient occlusion, that looks good. Emission, we know we only had a couple spots that were using that. And uh, over here too. Everything looks pretty fine. Now that we've exported everything out, in the next video, we are going to take everything that we've exported from Blender, the model, and the textures, unify them together, and then do something interesting with scripting to make this whole object come alive.